How's everybody tonight? Praise God. Are you blessed and highly favored? And it's a good night to die. Glory to God. It's a great night to die, isn't it? <laughs> Death is a wonderful place, especially to yourself. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. First John chapter 5. No? First John chapter 5. The mysteries of God are awesome. Mysteries associated with things that have been hidden and being revealed. And there's so many still mysteries that have not been revealed. There are revelations that God wants to release to each and every one of us. These are nuggets that we're able to grab hold to, to put the restraints onto the flesh. To get fresh revelation and fresh rhema from God. To get visitations, revelations, and dreams and visions. It should be a desire to each and every one of us to want more. To want to see more. To want to hear more. To want to get deeper into the king, things of God. So that there's an exchange made on a constant level. And even in the mysteries, even the Gospels, if you think about the Gospels of God, those are kind of like four views of the same story. Does everybody get it? And in these views, there are certain things that God allows us to view the same thing in different places to bring more understanding. But you must be in the Spirit to be able to view these things and understand these things. See, one of the things about deception, deception is a lie. That's what the enemy loves to do. He loves to deceive us. See, people don't realize that even in the areas of deception, if deception is a lie and we agree with a the deception, then it opens the door to the enemy. So we're to expose all deceptions. I don't care if it's governmental, political. I don't care if it's association. I don't care if it's a book. I don't care if it's a movie. I don't care what it is. We're to expose all deception. Why? Because you want to shut every door of the devil in your life. Every door. Amen? I mean, that's our responsibility. The Bible says make no place to the devil. That's why people go back they don't realize they've opened the door because they agreed in something that God is disagreeing about. And it could be two years later. Listen, the devil loves to wait for you to gather more people and tell everybody how good you're doing. And then he pulls the hook to bring shame to his name. The devil's not stupid, but he can't outwit the Holy Spirit. Amen. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Hallelujah. Let's speak it together. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. So there's a place of a state of being, of being born again, or just saved. And see, the enemy wants to get you back to the place of being saved, where you're not overcoming. Because if you just get back to being saved, eventually you're going to fall right out. It's a born-again place and position where you are filled with the Spirit of God and you are empowered from Most High to overcome. Amen? Again, verse 4, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. He didn't say to whatever is saved of God overcomes the world. He said whoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith is our connection. Your relationship with him. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who what? Believes. What's the word believe mean? Follows that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he who came by water and blood. Water and blood. Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water 
and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. So Jesus came, was formed with water, blood, and the Spirit. Amen? Representing the three tabernacles, three chambers of the tabernacle, and the triune God. And it says here in verse 7, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are what? One. So you have the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Amen? These are in heaven. Now, if you draw a line there, then they're the one who came into the natural realm. And there are three that bear witness on the earth. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So we see what connects the earth, the physical realm, to the spiritual realm is the Holy Spirit. Amen? So you must be filled with the Spirit to be connected. It says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes or follows in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not follow God has made himself a what? A liar. Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you, you who believe or follow in the name of our, the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So there's something, if you were to take the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, amen, and then the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and you were to close them together, you would have the Father and the blood, the Word and the water, and the Spirit and the Spirit. Does everybody understand that and see that? Can you visualize that? You might want to write that down so you can see that. The Father and the blood. The word and the water. What's the wa word? The word of God says, wash yourself with the what? With the word. Amen. And the spirit and the spirit. There's something specific why the father is attached to the blood. And we're going to talk about some of that. You know, for you and I, as God brings us through everything and we're learning things, we go through tests. Amen. And the more tests that you go through, the more that you pass, it builds a testimony. Amen? So your tests are building a testimony of truth, not of deception. And the Gospel of John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Oh, hallelujah. In verse 1. Everybody there? Let's speak it. In the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. So the Word is God. Amen? Wash into the Word like water. Amen. And it says, He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. What is the life? Light. Does everybody see it? Life was what? Light. And the light shines in darkness, and darkness did not comprehend it. In verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory to glory as the, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hmm. Full of grace and truth. So we see here the Word is God. In Him is life, and the life is the light. Now the Word took on human form. 
Amen? And when he took on human form, water and blood and spirit came into this realm. Does everybody get it? Okay, John chapter 3. What is the life? Light. John 3.18. What's the word believe mean? To follow. He who believes in him is not what? Verse 18. Condemned. But he who does not believe is what? Condemned. So he who follows... See, this is, what, this is so critical because this is where the enemy can stand before God and accuse man. Oh, he calls himself a believer, but he doesn't follow you. Remember, only followers make it home. Not believers. Followers. Because there's a lot of people who say they believe, but they don't follow. Then they're a liar. And that's how God looks at it. So this is so vitally important. Are we truly followers or we're we just calling ourselves believers? Amen? Oh, happy days. Let's go a little further. Verse 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Try to tell people, try to tell them the truth and they will constantly reject it, reject it, reject it, or refuse it because they refuse to accept the light because it exposes them. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen and that they have been done in God. Again, those that don't follow will be condemned, and those that practice evil, which evil is deceptive lies, amen, they, won't, they will be condemned. They hate the light, and the light, again, is life of God. So why do they hate the light? Because it is the life of God. But those who practice the truth come into the light, of eternal life because they're in the light they practice the light and they have fellowship with the light and Leviticus, Leviticus 17 hallelujah Leviticus 17 and verse 10 Let's speak it. And whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who eats any blood, I set my face against that person who eats blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, No one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwells among you eat blood. Whatever man of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For it is the life of the flesh, its Blood sustains its life. Therefore I said to the children of Israel, You shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of the flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Again, the life of the flesh is in the blood. People don't realize that even when you go out and buy a steak, they think that there's blood in it. Well, there really is. It is called a red dye. Hello. It is in blood. The blood has been drained from every animal and then filled with a red dye. It's a preservative to keep the animal. 
Is everybody okay? So now you know the truth. How do I know I was involved in health inspecting? Can you imagine me a health inspector? Snap. <laughs> Actually, at the time, I was out on bail. <laughs> and they made me go work at some place. So I had to go work at a summer job, but I was doing something else. But it was all everybody there was health inspectors. And that's when I had to learn all of the stuff about certain animals and whatever. And I found out that they put blood, red dye in the meat. So to this day, we do not eat the blood. I mean, when somebody goes out hunting, what do they do? They, they take the animal, what do they do? They drain the blood, don't they? And then they freeze it right away. Hello? So that's why in the occult realm, because the life of the blood is in the flesh. They love to condemn the life that God has given in the, in the physical realm. Does everybody understand? So even people, what do they do? They, the, uh, when Jesus bled on the cross, amen, it opened a door. But it opened a portal to throne, to home. But see, the enemy uses the blood of humans because Jesus' blood was pure. It's different. That was created by God Almighty. It was pure on no contamination, no sin. He never sinned. It was pure. We and me and you, we inherited sin in our blood. Amen. So we've been contaminated from the moment we gave our first breath. But in that, the powers of darkness love to utilize the blood that God used for life here and drink it, offer it up. And the more humans they can kill in an area, the more open portals they can get to bring in demonic forces. The life of the flesh in the blood. Now, the blood is precious to God, isn't it? Amen. As life, as the light of God, as light. So God, it's precious to God, is the blood, and so is the light precious to God. Amen. Again, the demonic partake of fleshly rituals and sacrifices by the created blood to open portals and powers through witchcraft. The devil loves wars. He loves the shed blood of man that God created to sustain the fallen nature of mankind. Now remember, the blood was created to sustain the fallen nature of mankind. Does everybody get it? Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. Now, I had to share all that so we can get to the area where we're getting to. We're almost there. <laughs> In verse 39, what does it say? All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is what? One kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another f of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. In other words, these are things that God has created because anything he creates has his glory. It's a representation of him. So also the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. That's what's awaiting me and you. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The first Adam became a what? A living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. And the second man is the Lord from heaven. 
as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as of the heavenly man, so are also those who are heavenly. And as, he, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. But I tell you a mystery, we shall all not sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Now this is powerful. The first Adam was made in the image of the Most High. Amen. He was made in the image of the Most High. The second Adam was a life-giving spirit. Hold on to these things. Hold on to the two precious things of God, light and blood. In Hebrews chapter 2. In fact, the teaching is called the light of blood. Hebrews 2. In verse 5. What's the enemy love to steal? Your identity. That's the thing we battle with every day, isn't it? Who we are. In verse, Hebrews 2, verse 18. Or verse 5, I'm sorry. Hebrews 2, verse 5 to 18. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. Verse 5. For he has not put the world to subject to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testifies in a certain place. One testifies in a certain place. It was like a heavenly courtroom. One's testifying in a certain place. Where? In a courtroom of heaven. And he's saying, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. That word angels is Elohim, meaning lower than God. A little lower than God. But he said, what is man? What man is he talking about? Adam. Somebody's bringing something to the throne of God, saying, what, you know, what's going on here? Why did you create man a little lower than you? What about us? It was an angel. You have made it a little lower than the angels, Elohim. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. Why have you done this? You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he, now he's talking about the Lord, put all in subjection under him, Adam. Does everybody see that? He left nothing that is not put under Adam. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels or Elohim, God. For the suffering of the death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things, and by whom all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. For which reason he now is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I put my trust in him. And again, here I am in the children whom God has given me. And as much then as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same 
that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Are we the seed of Abraham? Amen. Therefore in all things he had to be made like brethren, like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He's saying, what is this? It was almost like a courtroom where the angel was saying, why, why are you so mindful of man? A little lower than you. And, and we who carry your presence. See, angels were created in holiness to carry the presence of God. They're created to protect me and you. They're created to protect the word. But you and I are different. We're different. We can never be an angel, and an angel can never be me and you. Amen? They tried, <laughs> and it didn't work. Hallelujah. Jesus came as the first Adam of God's image with light and blood. With what? Light and blood. Adam uh, came with light. Adam originally came not with what we call blood. He came with light. Amen? And 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1. And, and uh, verse 5. And this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you that God is what? Light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we what? We lie and do not practice the truth. Again, I want to say that again. If we say we have fellowship with him, I'm a believer, I know Jesus, but you are walking in darkness, then you do not practice the truth, and God says, you lie. Amen? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, now this is powerful. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now again, what did he say? If you are walking in the light. Now we got to remember something. This is why the, it's the light of the blood. Why? Because the, God's blood, eternal blood, is light. Amen? Does everybody get it? God's blood is light. Because... God didn't need blood, did he? <laughs> he is light. That's his blood. The life of God is in his light. Amen? See, but the life for me and you is in the blood. But we carry the light now. That's what allows me and you to go home where the rest will stay here. Because we have life in the light that connects us to the eternal Without that light, you're not connected. That's why he says something very powerful. Listen, if you walk in the light as he is in the light and you have fellowship with one another, then the blood of Jesus Christ is going to cleanse you. Why? Because the blood of Christ is cleansing you so that the life has constant access to you by his spirit. Is everybody okay? Hallelujah. Now, if, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The light of God is his blood. That's who he is. Amen? And Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2. 
Genesis 2, 4. And let there be light. You're the light. You know, just touch and agree and you'll see everything. Hallelujah. <laughs> Genesis 2 and verse 4. Is everybody there? And this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now, you got to look at something here. God took and formed a man out of dust. You got to, you know, it's, people always think, well, man, he just pulled him up. I personally believe that he laid on the dust. Eye for eye, mouth for mouth, hand for hand, feet for feet. Just like Elijah laid on that young child. And the, the breath of God, the light of God went into that child and brought him back alive. I truly believe that God laid on that dust himself that he created And created his image in the dust. And left his impression in the dust. And called up his light and breathed into the nostrils of Adam. And Adam became a living being of light in the image of the Most High. Does everybody understand that? That's how he was going to have dominion, wasn't he? Amen? So he was in the image of the Most High. Was the any angels made in the image of the Most High? No. Oh, praise God. Is everybody okay? God breathed light right into him. Now, I really believe because this gave Adam authority over everything, didn't it? Oh, <laughs> it gave him authority over all things. Even remember, God created animals and said, send them to Adam and he's going to name them. God was teaching him how to be like him. There is the image of the Most High God, but then there is the Most High God. There's a difference. But Adam was in the image of the Most High God. Or even Lucifer had to submit to him. All angels, they were servants. Amen? I really believe Satan was furious and jealous having to serve Adam. Remember, angels are servants and carriers of God's presence or holiness to protect the Lord's offspring and inheritance. Again, God laid, I really believe that the Lord laid the Most High on that dust and created an image of himself, just like impressed. Amen? You know, we try to make angels in the snow. <laughs> Doesn't work that way, though. Now, after the fall of Adam, now, now there, there's some things here. This is wild because after the fall of Adam, now, now Satan, Lucifer, the serpent, amen, was in the garden protecting a, a tree, a place, a position. He was protecting it because it held knowledge of good and evil. That was hit. That was associated with him. It was his treasure because it represented him. Now, it wasn't what was, the, believe me, knowledge of good and evil was not in the tree. Hello? I mean, they didn't sap it out and drink it and woo, you know. No. But they partook of that deceptive food. However they did. And you know, when you take up something deceptive, doesn't it bring you blindness? Doesn't it bring you confusion? Amen? It brings another state of being. And then it says that um, 
Now this may be a clue of what that tree what really was. Because when Adam and Eve blew it, amen, and the Lord brought judgment on them, what did, what did, first of all, what did Adam and Eve cover themselves with? Fig leaves. Fig leaves. Don't you think they went back right to that tree and took the leaves off of that tree that they just partook of? Because for them, that was covering to them. So is it possible that the tree that they partook was a fig tree? Amen? It's very possible. But remember, it wasn't about the fruit of it or whatever. It was about the deceptiveness that brought them. And then when they got seduced, hello. Is everybody okay? Now, think about this. Even Jesus had the same circumstance with a fig tree. See, Adam's Judas was the serpent. Jesus' Judas was Judas. <laughs> Amen? So they bought, there was a parallel. Remember, there was a first Adam and a second Adam. One was a, from the dust, a living being. The other one was a life-giving spirit. Amen? The second, uh, the second Adam was Jesus was... <laughs> Light and blood. The first Adam was light until he fell. Once he fell, once fallen man had to have blood. Because he's no, no longer true light carriers anymore of truth. Is everybody okay? Go to Mark 11. Are you getting this? Mark 11. Oh, hallelujah. Again, we're looking through another, another view. Amen. Mark 11 and verse 12. It says, now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a what? Fig tree having what? Leaves. So the fig tree had leaves. Amen. And when he went to see if perhaps it would find something on it, when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And in response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. <laughs> I mean, it was almost like he was talking to the tree in the garden. Let no one ever eat from your fruit again. Don't let my children eat from your fruit again. Amen. Thank God we don't cover ourselves with figs, leaves. But I do like figs, I got to tell you. Dried ones only. <laughs> Go to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. The light of blood. But you might even say the life of blood. But it is the light of blood. Isaiah 14. And then you got to remember that when Adam and Eve, after the Lord gave them judgment... And he took the fig leaves off, didn't he? He said, I don't want you a part of that tree no more. And what did he do? He killed an animal and put the skin around him because it was blood shed for them. I'm giving you blood, a new set. This is now your covering. Why? Because you lost the light. That was my blood. Now I'm going to give you, 
I had to create blood for fallen man. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. Are we there? Let's speak it together. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. Now look it. He did not say he would be the most high. He said he would be like the most high. Who's he referring to? Adam. He's referring to who? Adam. Come on, Lucifer knew he couldn't be the most high God. I mean, think about that. The, not the God. His whole complaint was basically that God created Adam in, his, in, God's, in the image of God. Because Lucifer wasn't, who was God's right-hand man at the time. But jealousy and pride, hello, removed him, didn't it? Amen. And his response says, you'll be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Lucifer wanted to be like Adam. He knew he couldn't be like God, the God of eternity. He knew it. Amen. Is everybody okay? And 1 John chapter 3. Remember the Lord rebuked him because he said in his heart he was a God. What was he trying to do? Compare himself to Adam. Now, because the second Adam, Jesus, came and brought us life and we are his offspring, what does that make me and you? We've been restored to Adam's place. Original. The only thing that's left is our body. But see, we don't get it. We have a hard time with that. That's why the devil's thing to steal all the time is your identity. But when you really calculate this all out and put it in perspective according to the word of God and truth, we've now received the light of God that allows us to be eternal and in the image of the Most High. Why? Because that's why we're called His offspring. Aren't children in the image of their parents? Amen. Well, what makes me and you different than God Almighty? There isn't anything different. It's how a man thinks, so he is. We've been so programmed religiously program and deceive. Come on, we've been brought up in this way. That's the part that takes the hardest is breaking off all of this stuff, especially family traditions. Being holy was not cussing for a day, you know. Or maybe the missing a football game on Sunday and going to church. You did a good job. You might go to church on Easter and Christmas. But it wasn't about going to church. We were supposed to go to church and be trained. <laughs> Hello? We didn't go to church too much to get trained. <laughs> I know I didn't. First John chapter 3. Is everybody there? In verse 1. Let's speak it. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Well, if we're called children of God, we're in the image of the Most High. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall what? Be like Him. There's confirmation. For we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in him, in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So you got to have that. You got to have that connection. You know that, man, when you wake, what did David say? Man, when I wake, I know I'm going to be in your image. I'm going to be in your likeness. 
man, we've been lied to for so long. Not truly understanding who we really are. See, the enemy fears you. Fears you. But if you don't know who you are, he knows what you think. He knows it. Amen? Be like him. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10, let's speak it. What's it say? Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of man. Oh. Put on the whole armor of who? So whose armor is it? Oh. Oh. So when you put on the full armor of God, guess what happens? They don't see you no more. They see him. But we think we're just throwing on some armor. That's not what it is. You put it on that God's armor, not yours. He's given you his armor. Amen? It's his armor. He's perfectly fit for you. It came right from him. By the time it hits you, it fits perfect. Because he can do that. <laughs> He's the master tailor. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Well, the armor of man ain't going to do nothing. But if you put on the full armor of God, the enemy's not seeing you anymore. He sees the armor of God in the Most High, the one that created him. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, powers of darkness, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Then it tells you what to get dressed with. Amen? Remember, it's not the armor of man, it is the armor of God. So here it is. We carry the Father's blood. The blood of the fallen nature from God. And the armor of God. I mean, we're it. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? We're the ones. We're the chosen. We're the called. We're the called out. Romans 8. So that's why the word says, God's not given us a spirit of fear. If you know who you are, but power, love, and a sound mind. Amen? That sound mind is essential. Because that's where the pro problem is, is an unsound mind, unstable thoughts. Unmonitored thoughts. And once you agree with what the enemy comes, it burns a memory. And the enemy uses that memory. Your old man uses that memory when anything you touch and agree with the enemy. Oh, you got this. Oh, you got that. Or you got this. Boom, it's burned. Now you got to battle it and get rid of it. Hallelujah. Romans 8, verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed where? In us. That's the completion. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Well, wait a minute. Are sons of God in the image of the Most High? Yeah. For the creation was subjected to fertility not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also be delivered from bondage 
of the corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body, the completion. Amen? For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance, known as patience or endurance, and we're going to allow it to have its perfect work, aren't we? Isaiah 40. Oh, it's good to hear the pages and turn it on to Tuesday night. The light of blood. So you didn't know the blood had light, huh? <laughs> Isaiah 40. I was going to name it the first and second Adam, but it felt like a baseball game. Who's on first and who's on second, you know? I said, Lord, that just doesn't sound right. <laughs> Hallelujah. And verse uh, 28, 40, 28. Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall be utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint as we wait on the Lord. Why? Because as you're waiting on the Lord, there's an exchange always being made. And then close at Romans 5. Remember, the light is a representation of God's blood. Amen. Who created blood for me and you. And then, but he created the blood for Jesus to bring atonement because it's the pure blood that covers and washes away. So it doesn't just cover sins, it removes sin. Amen? That's why the Old Testament sacrifice is just covered, didn't remove it. Romans 5.18 Let's speak it. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And to God be the glory. Lord, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed for your fresh revelation. Lord, grant everyone here understanding and that we may put to practice of who we truly are as offsprings of you. In the image of the Most High, armed and dangerous, as sons and daughters, faithful and true, willing to go all the way, severing ourselves in the entanglements and affairs of this world, that we may be set apart for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Stay dressed with the glory.